Hello and welcome back for yet another science experiment. I have this whole like mad scientist vibe going on in this channel and I'm digging it. There's going to be more of that in 2023. So stay tuned. Uh, hopefully these experiments are helping people out there. That is the goal after all. But as you probably could tell from the title of this video, we're going to be doing another split sample comparison. But this time we're straying away from the theme that we have kept up until this point, which has been popular stool tests. And we're going to go a slightly different direction and talk about the organic acids test, the OAT, offered by Great Plains Lab. This is an immensely popular test uh, in the functional medicine field, in the nutrition field, in the like nutritional therapy kind of coaching world. Um, I have seen a lot of people who have had this test. I've run a number of these myself over the years. Um, but what I wanted to do in this experiment was see, similar to previous videos, if you collected the, a sample from the same person, same day, same, same bodily sample, would you get basically the same results? Or would you get basically the same actionable items from doing that test? And another way to kind of pose this is if, uh, if I sent a patient home to collect an oat test and they collected the sample in a slightly different way, would we get about the same information, right? So say somebody, uh, say somebody urinated in the middle of the night and they did not collect the pee from that urine sample and they just collected from the pee first thing in the morning. Would that offer the same information as if they had collected the pee at 4 a.m. like the test suggests that you should do? Or say that somebody starts the urine stream and they get the stream going and then midway through the stream, they stop urinating and they collect the sample midway through in the second half of that, that urine sample. So these are the sorts of things that I kind of have to wonder as a clinician is, is there gonna be variability either because the lab is not accurate and it's not measuring the things that they say they are and they're falsifying data? Or is there such a wide variation from minor, minor changes on the patient's end and does that make it an actual usable test from that standpoint? Like, should we just be sticking with tests that are offered in hospitals and they have a great deal of control? Or is an at-home test like this really a viable option? So these are some of the things that I kind of chew on. Uh, another thing to mention too is A, is that the, the tests in my mind don't need to be identical. They just need to be similar. Um, I think that that offers a lot of credibility when they're similar and like the clinical action items are going to be roughly the same from the two samples. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, I'm doing this series hoping to better understand and helping you guys better understand what tests are usable and accurate and valid and where we can actually put some weight in the findings that we're seeing. It is worth noting that the thing that we're really looking at right now is consistency, not validity, in the sense that you can measure the same thing twice, but measure it incorrectly or label it as the wrong thing. And you can be consistently doing that, right? So in, in an example, if I had a stool test and I was labeling something as bifidobacteria, but in actuality, I was measuring roseburia, like a completely different bacteria, and I was misnaming it and calling it something that it's not, but I was doing so consistently, I would see consistent results when looking at that bifido number. So I just wanna be clear that consistency does not necessarily mean that this information is true and accurate. It's just that consistency does give a bit more credibility. And I think it, it bodes well for the test overall and it bodes well for a lab when they could spit out similar samples from same person, same day, same stool or urine sample. So without further ado, let me show you the oats. Make myself a little head bubble here. All right. Now again, so these were taken same day, same person, me, and this was from the same urine sample. And I should mention, I, I urinated into one receptacle, stirred the pee a bit, and then I divvied it up into the two containers for the oat, as well as the other tests that we're going to get to later on. So I tried to keep this as clean and scientific and homogenized as possible. And urine, like that's, that's already pretty easy to homogenize. So I had a great deal of hope going into this. 
um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to toggle back and forth so that you guys who are like super nerds can look at the different numbers. But just for a starting point, I'm going to point out the couple that did vary more than I felt was reasonable. Um, first is number eight down here, carboxy citric acid. On the first organic acids test, so that's down here, on the first test, you could see my number is 0 0.23, which is right at the lower edge of that orange box. And then if we flip to the other one, it goes from that less than one up to 19, which makes it actually like slightly on the higher end of the normal range, if anything. So that one varied quite wildly. And I really, I don't know what to make of that one. A lot of the other numbers, if we toggle back and forth a little bit, so here I'll go two, one, two, one. Like there's little shifts here and there, but overall the numbers mostly match up and like where they fall on the bell curve mostly matches up. Um, the one that looks worse than it actually is, is number seven, Arabinose. So this is the quintessential candida marker. Uh, if you look, the first test here, my number is 27. On the second one, it's 30, but they depict it in a different way, right? When it's above that second standard deviation, they, they show it to you this way, as opposed to showing the entirety of the orange box and the little whisker hair thing. So it looks much worse than it actually is, but in reality, Arabinose is only going from 27 up to 30, which uh, that's basically the same in my mind, in my eyes at least. Um, so that one looks worse than it actually is. But overall, if we toggle back and forth a bunch of times, again, going back and forth from sample number one to sample number two, fairly consistent. Other than the Arabinose number, you don't really see a lot of stuff jumping around on this test, which again, I think is good. It's at least consistent, which I will you know, take for what it's worth. Uh, here's the lower part of the page. So again, like minor fluctuations here or there. But like, for example, looking down at for Crestol number 17 down here, we go from 2.6 up to 8.0, which seems like a big jump until you realize the top end of the range goes up to 75. And then that's not such a monumentous shift after all. Similarly, if you look up at number 10, Hyperic Acid, you'll see sample number two, I'm at 180. Sample number one, I'm at 146. That sounds like a very big jump. That's what, a 35 point jump. But if you acknowledge that the top end of their range goes up to 613, that's actually not a huge jump. And that's why the little, um, the little diamond isn't really shifting around a whole heck of a lot. Let's, uh, let's scroll down a little bit more. This was the other one that I was a bit taken aback by. Uh, I think that the organic acids test gets used quite a lot for oxalate purposes. Um, and it didn't line up as perfectly as I anticipated. So if you look at this top section, the oxalate metabolites, we can see glyceric acid is smack dab in the, the middle of the range. Glycolic acid on this one is a little bit high. And oxalate itself, oxalic acid is 42, which is right about in the middle of the normal range. On the other one, it's a bit of a different story. So oxalate and glyceric acid are both fine, like, even lowish normal, if anything. But look, glycolic acid all of a sudden goes right down to middle-ish of the bell curve, like within one standard deviation, which is, is in that bulk of the bell curve. So we go from 85, which is normal, to 122, which is considered elevated. Again, same person, same urine sample, pretty homogenous because it's liquid. It didn't take a lot of effort for me to stir that sample up. I don't, I don't know what to make of this. Um, and again, so we go uh, the first glyceric acid, we've got normal versus low normal, oxalate normal versus slightly lower variant of normal. It's that middle one that I'm really questioning here. Why is glycolic acid jumping all over the place? I don't know. It makes me a little bit tempted to think, oh, what if I had done a third out? Like if I had a third data point, but for the love of God, I'm not going to collect that many samples for you people. So <laughs> I'm just going to leave it be for the time being. Um, let's look at some of the other ones though, while we're here. So that one also, I'm a little bit questioning. Uh, glycolic acid for the record would be elevated in like a type one hyperoxaluria kind of situation, um, which is a genetic condition. I don't believe I have that, 
particularly since my oxalate itself is quite low in this sample. And I don't stringently avoid oxalate. I drink almond milk at least a couple times a week. Um, I sometimes will have almond based crackers. I'll do spinach sometimes. So I'm not really strictly avoiding oxalate. So I don't think that's the reason why that number would be so low. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know why that, that second marker is jumping around a little bit, but made me take pause. Uh, looking at some of the other ones though, we've got lactate and pyruvate. Again, we could see normal and low normal, similar, um, maybe again, slightly, they both skew slightly lower. Now I will point out too, that I made sure to measure out the exact same amount of urine in the two samples that I submitted. So there's a, if I remember correctly, there's a little line on the cup. I made sure to fill them exactly to the line, not a millimeter over, not a millimeter under. So I also, I don't think we could chalk this up to like a different amount of urine. And again, I stirred up the samples and I pipetted it in very carefully. I was really trying to homogenize and normalize the amount of um, contents that were in each container. So I don't think we can say that that's what's going on here. Um, but again, pyruvate and lactate, you really wouldn't treat these either way. Um, like they're, they're both pretty unremarkable. Similarly, let's go down to the, uh, Krebs cycle and the mitochondrial markers. Hold on. Forgetting how far I scrolled. Uh, so mitochondrial markers, again, I'll just toggle back and forth. They're fairly unremarkable and they're fairly consistent between the two tests. So here's oat number two. And here's oat number one, and then we'll go back to number two versus number one. Again, there's a little bit of shifty shifty happening, but it's not anything completely like extraordinary. Uh, citric acid number 29 is going from 250 to 320. But again, the top end of the range is 507. So that's a pretty large number. Uh, there's going to be a little bit more variation probably in that measurement anyhow. Um, you know, it's like when you start measuring something that's in the upper hundreds or even thousands range, you don't split hairs over like a difference of 10 or 20 points versus if the range only went up to 10 and there was a difference between the two samples of 10, that would be a huge difference. So that's what I'm suggesting here. Um, let's look down a little bit. I don't really use the neurotransmitter markers personally on the oat test, but just to show you for sake of completing this, uh, this train of thought. So there's one versus the other one. So pretty darn consistent. Again, clinical utility, I'm not gonna discuss in this particular video, uh, but at least they're consistent, which I'm happy with. Uh, then getting into the next page, we've got some folate metabolism markers, ketones, and then the nutritional markers we'll do next. Uh, similar story, they track reasonably well with each other. So toggling back and forth a few times so you guys can see. We go boom and boom. You could see uracil number 41 went up a bit. So it went from smack dab in the middle of the normal range to ever so slightly higher, but it's really not making a big clinical difference at least. Uh, looking down at the nutritional markers section, B12, the marker methylmalonic acid, 1.8 versus 1.7. That's fine. They're both beautiful. Uh, the marker for vitamin B6, 3.7 versus 3.0, basically the same. Vitamin B5, looks like I'm swimming in the stuff. Uh, riboflavin, maybe shows a slight, slight need for riboflavin, if anything. So 2.28 versus 0.29. Again, the numbers are consistent. Uh, vitamin C, I don't really pay much attention to because the lab has told me before that it's not actually a nutritional marker. It is a, uh, it, it's just not very stable in the urine and that it's not representative of your nutritional intake of vitamin C, which infuriated me to hear that because they put it under the nutritional marker section, which suggests it's a nutritional marker. But again, that's coming directly from the company. Um, it was a webinar or seminar that I took with them years back where they said that. Um, so I'm not going to pay much attention to vitamin C personally. Uh, CoQ10 looks like it's fine. It's either in the norm, like middle of the normal range or better than average. Uh, NAC, you don't really see this unless the person is supplementing with N-acetylcysteine. 
interestingly, I was supplementing with some NAC at the time of this test, and it's really barely showing up at all on here. And then biotin, um, again, neither of those are suggesting a need for biotin, so it's pretty consistent with itself. And then last but not least, uh, the amino acid metabolites are almost always unremarkable on oats tests, unless you have a blatant genetic condition like maple syrup urine disease or PKU or something like that. But uh, I'll show you that in a second anyhow. But we do have these a marker for glutathione need, uh, methylation and toxic exposure, ammonia and aspartames and salicylates. And again, you can see they're pretty pretty much the same. Uh, that glutathione marker is jumping a little bit between the two samples, but it's, again, still, you wouldn't give me glutathione based off of this test, right? You wouldn't say that I'm deficient based off of either of these numbers. So I could take that. And then last but not least, we'll scroll down and we'll look at some of these amino acid markers and down lower the phosphoric acid. Let's see. Yeah, so if you look, most of them are at zero or very low. Um, number 74, malonic acid, is jumping a little bit. So we go from slightly higher end of the bell curve to higher end of the bell curve. But again, like you don't really take action on these ones unless they're elevated beyond the second standard deviation, typically, or at least that's how I've treated it. Uh, and then phosphoric acid, interestingly enough, goes from 845 up to 1332. And that is enough of a jump that it went from being flagged as low to no longer being flagged as low. So that's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I think overall, let me pull myself out of head bubble mode. Um, I think overall, the test is fairly consistent within itself. Like I said, you can measure something incorrectly and do it incorrectly the same way every single time. Or you can measure a metabolite thinking that it is clinically significant when in actuality it is not clinically significant. So this is not to say that I fully endorse organic acids testing or that I think that they are always giving you the clinical indications that you think they are or you're hoping that they will. Uh, but at least the two samples are reasonably consistent within themselves. Again, same person, same day, same urine sample kind of a thing. So at least I'm going to take that for what it's worth. Uh, if you want me to do a series later on about either how to interpret the organic acids test or the validity of these markers, let me know. I have been sitting on my butt wanting to do uh, some videos about like the actual the research behind some of the yeast metabolites in particular and really dissecting whether or not organic acids testing is a viable, reliable way to test for yeast overgrowth. And I just haven't done it yet because it's such a daunting task to research something like that. So if you guys comment down below, that might give me the kick in the rear that I need to get that video out to you sometime in 2023. Let me know if that's something that you guys would be interested in. Um, but like I said, this was part one of a several part series. In the next video, I'm going to be comparing the organic acids test, which we just looked at with Genova's NutriEval, because surprise, not only did I collect two organic acids tests from the same urine sample from the same day, I also collected a Genova NutriEval, which is both urine and blood, and it's probably the closest thing to a direct competitor for this particular test that you can get. So we're going to be looking at, again, what happens when you use two different tests from two different companies to try to assess a lot of the same stuff, and are we comparing apples to apples, or is it more of an apples to oranges kind of comparison? So in the next video, we're going to talk about comparing the organic acids test versus the Genova NutriEval. Uh, and then there's a third one coming out a little bit later, which I won't reveal quite yet, but I threw in some LabCorp testing as well. It was a weird, weird day collecting all these samples, but I'm excited to be here sharing this with you and happy new year. Thank you for being here. Thank you for subscribing and commenting and liking all the things that you guys do on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. And I can't wait to make more videos for you in, in the new year. So Happy New Year. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.